All right, here we go. Uh, first of all, make sure you, oh yeah, we didn't mention this, but the yard sale. You can start setting up Friday at 6 p.m. and you'll have the code, it's in that handbook that you got, so you can uh, get in and out of the gym. Uh, and it starts Saturday at 6.30. I promise you, every year that we've done this, there's been people at the door. When I unlock the door at 6.30, they come in. So. You definitely want to be set up there. You want to be there because if I let them in, nobody's at your stuff. They just go to the next person's stuff and pick up stuff. And so uh, make sure you're there. And all that information is covered on that handout sheet. So don't forget the yard sale. Krispy Kreme cards, and we already mentioned those, but if you've sold all the ones that you've got and you need more, we've got some of those. Just turn in the money for what you got. And remember, if you're not selling them, no big deal. You just turn them back in. That way you don't get charged for them. So, I mean, you can break even by just turning them all back in. But if you keep them, don't turn them in, then of course you're going to get charged for those cards. So that's still going on. Mm -hmm. uh, we've collected the homework. So I think we got the homework all in. Make sure you get all the homework turned in. Uh, remember, it's just a letter grade if it's late. So if you forgot it today, get it turned in, and we'll go from there. And that'd be true with Monday's homework also. Just make sure you get it turned in. How much money are you spending on those cards? Uh, it's in that it's in that day to remember it's like uh, here in a, a week or two uh, we stop the Krispy Kreme card sale and we go and we collect all those and make those right and then we go start selling the barbecue sale tickets because remember the barbecue sale seniors only only class in the whole school so the seniors on the barbecue sale gets the profit from that. So if you sell 100 tickets, you're gonna get a lot of moolah in your account for that. Uh, so the, the ticket sales from the barbecue, not for juniors or sophomores or freshmen, but for the seniors, is actually a senior uh, fundraiser. You don't get the profit from everybody else's, it's an athletic department fundraiser, but you do get the profit from your individual sales of your individual barbecue tickets. Okay. So basically, as this comes to an end, then you start selling the barbecue tickets. And we get 50% of It's about 50%, but it's always based on how much uh, product we had to purchase. How much is uh So sometimes it's, for example, we did pork, sometimes it was only 30% because the pork prices were so high. So it's always determined on how much we had to spend on <coughs> product and how much we sell. You do all the figure, you pay all your bills, you got this much profit, and then that profit's divided by how many cards you sold. So it's always a little bit different. But anyway, don't forget about all the fundraising going on. We'll still talk about that more uh, as time goes. But uh, so open your Bible. Uh, Gabe, we're, we've already opened our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. So that's where we're at, okay? You see it? 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. I don't know if you highlight in your Bible or if you underline your favorite verses. Uh, some people do that, some people don't. I've always been one that, I mean, this is the scripture, it's God's word. I want to be a student of this book. And so, man, I mean, you'll, you'll see stuff I've got written all in my Bible. It's just like I wanted to remember something, I highlighted something, because uh, this, this is what God's letter to me. It's his owner's manual to me. It's like I want to know how to run, I want to know how to live, and so I'm going to look at this, and I'm going to study it. I'm going to be a student of the word. So this my opinion, I, I think you need to take notes in and highlight different things. But either way, if you do or if you don't, these are the verses that you're going to have to have memorized for the test. Okay? You have a quiz Friday. You don't have to have it memorized by Friday. You do need to know the reference by Friday. Okay? So guess what I'm going to ask you? Here's, here's a great quiz question. On Friday, you're going to get a piece of paper and it says, okay, what's the reference for our scripture memory for this week? And you would say 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. Okay, so let's take a look at it because you do need to be working on it. And remember, there's always something you can study. You always got homework in biblical worldview. How, how can I say that? Because you can start memorizing that, that scripture. Remember, there's going to be three chapters, three scripture references, and those have to be memorized verbatim for the test. And so you always got something you can work on in biblical worldview. Here they are, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. In other words, and we keep saying this word because you're going to see it again and you need to know what it is, to, but to refute. 
What does refute mean? We've, we've talked about it a couple times already this week. Refute means what? I mean, what's it even sound like? Refuse. Yeah, sort of refuse. Deny. Deny, disprove. So you're, I mean, those are the links. So refute is like to disprove something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refute this. I, I'm going to disprove it. I'm going to get some stuff and I'm going to have a logical thought of uh, reasoning and I'm going to disprove it. But what word are we continuing to use? And you'll see it on different things and quizzes and tests is refute. Uh, in, in biblical world in Christianity apologetics is a word that you'll hear from time to time again and that's just proving things that are right or wrong disproving but refute is specifically proving so uh, the apologetics is pretty neat because uh, it just in, in proving God's word to be true and so in the great sense some words that you'll need to know. Apologetics, you need to know what refute means, and we'll go from there. So verse 5, so what we're going to do, we know that our battle is not going to be physical. I mean, I've never had in my life of 62 years, I've never had a physical war and battle. I don't know if I turn that on. Is that on? Take a look. I don't know if I've ever had a physical battle. I've never had to fight somebody for my Christianity. It just hasn't happened. Have I been called names? Has there been things said about me? Has there been people disagree with me? Have I had to refute? Have I had uh, words? Yes, you, you, you do. You, you will that. But in a sense here, that's what the scriptures are saying. He said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not material. They're not flesh. But our battle for this spiritual warfare is this spiritual battle that we're against. And so it goes to verse 5 and it says, so what do we do with all these thoughts and attacks and doubts that we have? Well, we cast down those imaginations of every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. So if it's against God, I'm going to try to cast it down. If someone tells me they don't believe in God, I'm going to try to cast that thought down. But see, it's not a, we're not going to fight. And so the winner of the physical fight, we, we have a wrestling match, we put on our boxing gloves, we fight, and the winner gets to claim there's no God or there is God. It's not going to be that kind of battle. It's going to be this spiritual battle. And so in this, we cast down those imaginations that are against God, against the knowledge of God, and then the verse says, and bringing into captivity every thought, obedience to God. You just got to do that. Every thought and obedience to God. So my thoughts of the beginning of the world. So what are my thoughts about the beginning of the world? Well, the scripture says, I'm going to have those in obedience of Christ. So whatever my thoughts are, whatever my beliefs are, everything that I do, my action, what? Is going to come through here. Is going to come through here. That's why if you, if you have biology here, most of you probably did. Uh, you've had a chemistry text here. You've had earth science here. It's like, okay, here's the biology book. If the biology book is opposite of Genesis chapter 1, which book am I going to toss out of this school? I'm tossing out the biology book that goes against this, and I'm keeping this book. So for 51 years, this has been the master text of BCA. The other books have to follow suit with truth. So if, if something comes in, if it's a history book, if it's a biology book, and it's like contrary or in opposition to this, I'm not throwing the word out. What am I throwing out? I'm throwing out that textbook. And so this verse tells us, why, why does the academy do that? Well, I mean, it is here. We're going to cast down all those things that are against God. I'm casting out that book. And so in the midst of it, we just we follow the scripture. So that's a memory verse for the test. The reference will be for Friday. You're on page three in the textbook now. So take a look at page three. Uh, some good things here for you to do. Uh, Hopefully, we've highlighted some things here. We started in worldview. Uh, 
we looked at worldview lenses, uh, different way we see the same evidence, but yet because of our view, our worldview, hopefully when you hear that worldview, what's your worldview, you, you sense that view with lenses and glasses, so your worldview view glasses, your viewfinders, if you will, whatever those are, you're going to look at the same evidence and come back with a different conclusion. So that's all happening here on page two and three. So for example, on the quiz of Friday, so page three, what, what do you think would be a great question from page three? Because you've not had one of my quizzes yet. Well, I'll take that back. We did have one quiz. So we, this will be the second quiz. What, what do you think I'm going to pull from page three? What kind of question do you think I'm going to ask on page three? One, two, and three. That's right. So tell me what the options are. So you're going to get attacked by false theories. You're going to be attacked by, okay, let's just say evolution. That's a good one, and that's one we keep coming back to. So you're going to get attacked by evolution. What are you going to do? Option one, option two, or option three? So you need to know what those are. Remember option one? Yeah, that's quit. What is it? Give in. Give in your faith completely. Okay, I'm not a Christian anymore. Oh, here's my Bible. I don't want it. I don't believe in God. I'm just, I give it in. I'm going to join the majority. I'm going to join what seems to be even the more intelligent side. Or number two, you're going to give in a little bit. Now, let's admit today, that's the temptation most of us face. I mean, you, I, I would die for God. You're not going to get me to disclaim my belief in God. But you know what I am tempted sometimes? And this is what Satan uses on all of us? Just give it a little bit. It won't hurt anything. Just give it a little bit. Of course, you know what the book says. But only... On the re really disputed issues like evolution and homosexual marriages. Not everything. I'm not going to give up Easter. I'm not going to give up Christmas. I'm not going to give up like my salvation. My goodness, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He came back to life. Over 500 witnesses saw him for 40 days. He left. He sent the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, that 50th day. And guess what? He's coming back just like he left. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to throw that away. But I'll give in those hot topic areas so I don't have to argue with people. Of course, the book would say that is not a good option either. In option three, you don't give in at all. But now, as you turn the pages on four and five, what question do you think I'm going to ask? Because that is a question I'm going to ask. That, that'd be on the quiz. So what do you think I'm going to ask about maybe pages four or five? What do you think? The three, um, uh, is a chain of building with no lens. Oh, yeah, that, that's definitely one of the things. And I'm not going to give you everything I'm going to cover because I already did that in the lectures on Monday and Tuesday. But, but just this little review, yeah, man. I mean, that's all right, Michael. It's good. It's like, okay, what are the illustrations? How many illustrations does a book give? How many we talk about? Three. What are the illustrations of worldview? <coughs> of course, the, the chain, we've, we've illustrated that a hundred times. Well, maybe not that, but at least uh, five or six. A building. A building. So, remember, a building has what at its base? Foundation. The foundation. So, a worldview is built on the foundation. And then the third illustration? Lens. Yep, is the lens. And we put on the different lens, and we understand that, what those lens mean. Uh, so, now we're to page six. So, we talked about three illustrations, and then we talked about ingredients. Okay, so we're still talking about worldview. Worldview illustrations, how did we illustrate it? Uh, we looked at the chain, the building, and also the lens. So now we're looking at ingredients. So we're trying to define and put together what is the meaning of worldview. Because everybody's got a worldview. Everybody, remember? They can be different, but everybody's got a worldview. The class is called biblical worldview. And so here we are on page six and seven. Now we're looking at worldview ingredients. Guess, guess what's going to be on the quiz? One, two, three. So, the, yeah, it'd be like, okay, uh, there's three ingredients to worldview. Uh, give me those three ingredients. Okay? Give me those three ingredients. And so the three ingredients is what? A worldview contains a head and heart system. Remember that head and heart are those basic beliefs, assumptions, and values. Uh, it, 
A worldview will contain a big story, right? I mean, that's what we have here. We have a story. Uh, matter of fact, it's the best story ever. I mean, it's a worldview. And so in a worldview, you're going to have always a big story. Anybody's worldview will tell a big story. And, and remember, that's from beginning to end. And then, what's the third ingredient? Yeah. So whatever your worldview is, man, it's going to make you do something. I mean, it is. Uh, if my worldview is that uh, that squirrel that runs around in my backyard is like my grandpa that was reincarnated, guess what? I'm going to try to protect that squirrel. See, my worldview, whatever your worldview is, is going to make you produce action. If I really thought that was my grandpa reincarnated, first of all, I wouldn't shoot the squirrel. As a matter of fact, I'd feed him and try to take care of him. That, that sounds silly to us, but that's the illustration. Every worldview that you have produces action of that person that holds to that worldview. And so those are the three ingredients. So pretty clear there. I, I will say this. In this first one, the head and heart, Remember this head system are those basic beliefs. I mean, head, you think of the brain. So head and heart. Heart is like what you, what you care for and what you value and what you love. And so everybody's worldview includes a head and heart system. But there's not many people who just like, these are the facts. No, no, there's something in their heart too this heart system that makes the world view. So it's a head and heart system. So the head is just right there. It's made of, a, of basic beliefs. And I hope, hope you wrote that in. So head system right there on page six. Head system, you can write it in, is made up of basic beliefs. So you want to write something in for the quiz or the test? Write it there on page six. Right there, bold print, last bold print on page six, head system. A head system, and then you could write in, is made up of basic beliefs. Okay? So this head and heart system, head system, this system, this, this first ingredient of a worldview is made up of those views. Okay? It is also made up of a heart system. So remember, it's a head and heart system. A head and heart system. So notes, highlighting, if you write, you got these highlighted, it's pretty cool. And so there it is, the heart system, page eight. You, you can write this by the heart system. You see that bold print right in the middle of the page on page eight, a heart system? You can write this, a heart system is made up of values. So you got the head and heart system. This head is made up of some basic beliefs. This heart is made up of values. Okay? Okay. Uh, and you can write out right there on page eight, right in the column. You see that margin over there, the margin on page eight? There's just like, you got a little space there. You can write this, what you love matters. What you love matters, that, that matters in your worldview. So what you love matters. So man, here's a great true and false question. Come Friday. I mean, great true and false question. Does what you love matter? Yes. Yeah, it does. What you, what you love matters, man. It helps it helps you form this worldview. Feet off the chair, chair. It's what, it just matters. I, that, that was pretty easy to see, right? I mean, what I care for, what I love, is going to help me shape my worldview, and my worldview then... This last ingredient of worldview is world story. So the second ingredient, I'm sorry. So the first ingredient, head and heart system. Head and heart. Basic beliefs, what I love. That thing comes together, that's the first ingredient of worldview. The second ingredient we find on page 10, right at the top. It's a master story. Here's a term that you need to know. It's called meta narrative. It's right up the top of the page. So we're talking about the second ingredient of worldview. 
The first one, head and heart system. The second one is right here on page 10. Master story. You see it? It says master story. Top of page 10. It says ingredient two. So what's the second ingredient? Master. It's a master story. And what is this master story? What's this big story? This big master story. What are we going to call it? Meta narrative. And that is at the top of page 10. It says the second, we're at the top of page 10 if you're reading along with me. The second major element in worldviews is a story. A worldview tells a master story. A big story that has the beginning and tells what happened afterwards to shape the world into what it is. Such a big story is sometimes called, you're reading it with me, you see it there, meta narrative. Say it with me. Meta narrative. Say it with me one more time out loud. Meta narrative. So what is the master story? What is the big story? What is the second ingredient? Meta narrative. Okay, so this meta narrative just tells a big story. A big story. Okay, so let's talk about the big story of evolution. Okay, so let's talk about the worldview, the big story of evolution. Okay, so remember yesterday? Everybody comes back to a faith statement. Uh, my faith statement comes back to Genesis, comes back to creation, comes back to God. Who did all of this? Who created this thing? God. So everything comes back to God. That, that's a faith statement. We believe. We have faith in God. Everything else he created, everything else to where you get down here to be. Okay, let's think about evolution. Okay, so let's talk about the big story of evolution. Okay, well, first of all, uh, remember most people take you back to the Big Bang, but what was before the Big Bang? There was just, we call it matter in science, but stuff, uh, material. There was some gases. Where did all that come from? Well, it was just there. Okay, that's what I'm saying about God. God was there. I have faith in God. They have faith in who? Nobody. They have faith in what? Matter, space, stuff. And that stuff just crashed. The Big Bang happened. There was some different non-life forms. The life forms changed to some kind of bug. And basically, the bug evolved to some kind of bigger bug, and the bigger bug evolved to some kind of animal, and that smaller animal, and bigger animal into where we are today. So that's their life story. That's the meta narrative of that evolutionist in a very simple form. So big story. So what's what's the beginning? What's the meta narrative? The beginning of an evolutionist. It just, they have faith that that gas somehow was there and it, it banged into what we got now here through, through hundreds of years and just evolved. So what's the end of their story? What's the end of a story of an evolutionist? Just basically most of them will say we're just going to use up the planet and we're all just going to die. And, and who, who is surviving the longest? The strongest. Right? Mm -hmm. Darwin, evolution, survival of the what? The fittest. So that's their story. So okay, so raw to raw. So be it. So I don't know about you, but that's pretty non-inspiring. That, that, that's it. If you're strong, you might survive. You might not. Somebody else might take over. So, sort of a non-inspiring story. Uh, look with me on page 10. Right up at the second paragraph. Somebody read that for me today. Anybody want to volunteer? Just say, I want to read the second paragraph. Anybody? 
Hey, we just start over here with Aiden and move through today. Second paragraph, page 10, and we're talking about a master story, and we're talking about a master story here of, of an evolutionist, basically. So tell me the story of, of this Project Steve. What, what would their story look like, Aiden? Just read that to us. So progress still further forward, toward, but well, future extinction as the energy of the universe burns out. Okay? Uh, I don't know about you, but that story don't do much for me. Okay? So the master story. Every worldview that is has a meta narrative. Again, what's meta narrative? A meta narrative is what? A big story. I mean, just think of narrative. Narrative is a story. I mean, if you think of narrative, it's a story. It's a story form. It has characters in it. It has a beginning. It has an end. It's just a story. So meta narrative is a big story. So that, that's their big story. Every worldview has got a story. Okay? So now we think about alternate stories. Look on page 11. So you read through here and you, you see this alternate stories. Okay? So... We're looking at stories because remember, every worldview, we illustrated it, but we have now shown the ingredients. Every worldview has head and heart, but even with a head and heart, then a person still needs a story to go along with it, and that's the second ingredient of a worldview. So, so you see alternate stories. You, you see the alternate story of secularism. See the bullet print there, number 11, alternate stories of secularism. Uh, and it goes something like this. How's their story? Well... However we got here, we're here now, and the one unchanging fact about humanity is that we won't all agree why we're here anyway because we all believe different things about the gods and lack thereof. Our social problems come from the way religion heats up simple, solvable conflicts and the holy wars because we just can't know what, who's right. Religion would stay out of education. Religion should stay out of politics. It should stay out of law and the marketplace. Humanity will improve people can just learn to keep their religion private. So secularism is not the answer. Marxism, you see that? That's on top of page 12. You see all these alternate worldviews, postmodernism, and then you get to the Christian story. Okay, so the Christian story, what, what's, what's, what's the Christian story? What's, what's the book about? Because if we got a biblical worldview, remember every worldview has got a head and heart, and it also has what? A story. So what's the story of a biblical worldview? Let's just sum it up real quick. And you can highlight it. There it is. CFR on page 12. The Bible is the story of what God is doing to glorify himself by redeeming his fallen creation. This is the story of creation, fall, and redemption. If you forget everything else this school year, remember a biblical worldview is CFR. Just, just say that to yourself one time. CFR. So CFR. Let's, let's just, I mean, you really got to get it. You're going to hear this the rest of the year. So, so what does the C stand for then, Trey? The C just stands for? Creation. And then what does the F stand for? Oh. And what does the R stand for? Redemption. Redemption. That's the big story. So how does that play out in here? How does CFR play out in the Word of God that you got right in front of you right now? Okay, let's talk about C. So we started with Aiden. Gabe, I think we're over to you maybe. So tell me about C. So tell me about the CFR. Tell me about the C in the Word of God. So where do, where do I turn to find the C? Book of Revelation? No. What, what does C stand for? No. Creation. CFR, let's say them out loud. Gabe, say creation. creation. The F is fall, say fall. And say the R is redemption. If you forget everything else in here, 
about biblical view. What's the big story of the Bible? What's the biblical view? CFR. So creation. So where do I turn? 66 great books here in the Bible. Inspired word of God. So Gabe, where, where would I turn? In, yeah, man. And, and really, uh, how, how many chapters here in Genesis? Let's, definitely the first two. That's exactly right. Uh, by We get to chapter three and we're starting to find out about something else. So right, creation, 66 books in the Bible. We got it all here. Gabe says, no, man, that, that's just Genesis 1 and 2. C, creation. God creates something. So the, the F stands for what then, Aiden? No. Somebody oh. help me. Oh. The fall. So we got creation, we got the fall. So how much of the fall is in here? So we're in chapter 3. And look what happens in chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord had, God had made. And he said unto the woman, so the serpent, which is the devil, is saying unto the woman, Yeah, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree. So we start finding that, and then the temptation happens, and then lo and behold, and the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and to the tree to be desired to make one wise. And she took of the fruit thereof. That is the start of the F, the fall. So we got creation. And then by the time we get to chapter 3, verse 6, the fall happens, man. I mean, what happens to Adam and Eve? They die. They do eventually die. Do they change homes? <laughs> they get king out of the garden. They did. Yeet. What did Cain and Abel say? Their mom made them out of a house and home. That's a joke. But anyway, so in the midst of that, we got creation. We got the fall. And then immediately, we start seeing God at work in something. And it's the work of redemption. I mean, it's the work of redemption in chapter 3. So we got... We got a few chapters, a few verses about C. We, we got, man, the fall happened. And then redemption, the R. So what happens in redemption? Chapter 3 says this. It's pretty interesting. And it goes into here and says, listen. Uh, and Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, eaten of the tree, I command thee. And so we're starting to find the fall. And in the sweat of thy brow... Of the face thou shalt not eat of bread till thou return into the ground, for thou it was taken for dust and art, and thou unto dust thou shalt return. And so we start mentioning this. And then you go on down through here in verse 22, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man has come as one of us to know good and evil. Now let's put forth his hand and also uh, take the tree of life and eat and live forevermore. Therefore God sent forth him from the garden of Eden until the ground from which he was taken. So all that starts happening. And, and, and they just go on down through here, but then immediately God told the serpent that, listen, you, you might have hurt us. You might have bruised our heel, is what it says in the scripture. Satan bruised my heel. I mean, you can get bruised heel, you can still live. But what does Christ say immediately? What does God's word say immediately to Satan? But I'm going to bruise your what? Head. Now, that would be a mortal blow. So Satan, is Satan going to cause us trouble? Absolutely. He's going to cause us trouble. Did he cause Jesus trouble? He caused Jesus trouble. So are we better than Jesus? No, we're not better than Jesus. Jesus was troubled by Satan. We're going to be troubled by Satan and his demons and the evil influence. We're going to be bothered. We're going to bruise the heel, the scripture says. But then what does God say about the serpent or Satan himself? I'm bringing somebody that's going to take you out with a fatal blow to the head. And so... There we know someday that will happen. Has that happened yet? Well, it did sort of happen like that. On the cross of Calvary, death 
Jesus came back, but eventually God will put that stop to Satan, and he'll be cast into the bottomless pit. So we have CFR. So what about as you come down through here? So what happens then, and I, I think we're moving this way again with you, Andrew. So